Who here can say they believe in magic? Who here has seen things that cannot be easily explained, that appear so unlikely they seem to be magical, that go against all the odds, statistical probability, and forecasts, but they happen anyway? I have seen things like that. I have seen people make personal changes that are so unlikely, unbelievable, they appear to be magical. And I've seen that happen in the most unlikely of places. Within the walls of prisons, such as this one, HMP Park, managed by G4S for the Ministry of Justice, right here in Bridge End, in the heart of our community. Around 1,600 people serving sentences within these walls. Now, for the last 26 years or so, I've worked with people in prison, here and other places, their children, their families, and prisons abroad. And when I think about all the hundreds, probably thousands of people I've come into contact with over that time, I've tried to distill what it is that enables some people to make those changes and to keep them, whereas others struggle. Now, I can't stand here and tell you what the exact formula is for making and keeping personal change. I don't know what that is. Perhaps there isn't one. But what I am going to do is tell you what I've experienced, what I've seen, and how, over those years, I've tried to make sense of it. I've asked the question of lots of people over the years what it is that's helped them make that change. And for me, it comes down to three things. Hope, family, and resilience. If, in a prison environment, you can have hope, even the slightest glimmer of hope, if you can have that and hold on to it, then personal change is possible. If, in a prison environment, you're lucky enough to have family, whatever that means, someone significant in your life who is there for you, who supports you, who listens to you, who loves you, then that chance of personal change is kindled into a fire that starts to burn bright. And if, in that prison environment, you are fortunate enough to be naturally resilient, or perhaps you're someone who, with help and with nurturing, can become resilient, then the flames of that personal change become stronger and stronger. So when I think back to all the people that I've come across, for me, it is those three things, hope, family, and resilience. I remember working with a man a few years ago who was coming to the end of a very long sentence. And this was a person who accepted responsibility for what they had done and the damage they had caused people, the damage they'd caused his own children. And he had done everything that he could in that time to try and make those personal changes. He had been in a number of different prisons and was coming to the end of his sentence. And we were chatting one day, and he said to me that over the time, he had become tolerant to being in prison. He had learnt how to survive, how to adapt. He had got used to the environment. But he said there was one thing that he could never get used to, he could never get tolerant to. And this is the way he described it to me. He said, I have a constant and eternal feeling of homesickness for my children and my families. I wake up with it, and I go to sleep with it, and I can never be rid of it. Constant feeling of homesickness. I want you to try and imagine, if you will, what it's like to be in prison. Perhaps you've got experience of that. Statistically speaking, the majority do not. 
to try and imagine for a moment. Now, I'm not talking about the nature of the crime or whether you're innocent or guilty. I'm talking about people who are in prison, who accept responsibility for what they've done, one way or another, and who are allowed to have contact with their children and their family. Because, of course, not everyone is. The majority are, but not everyone is. So imagine that for a moment. What do you think you would miss the most? Imagine yourself lying on your mattress, looking up at the ceiling in the cell on that first night. Everything you know taken away, your control, your freedom, your independence, your choice, your work, your social life. What do you think would hurt you the most? Well, I've asked that question to many people and overwhelmingly the response is about family. And what I have seen is that that can become used. That can become the catalyst for change that is more powerful than any other. More powerful than getting a job, finding somewhere nice to live, all those things, all those practical solutions. The fire that burns within all of us about belonging, nurturing, love and families is no different for people on the other side of a wall. We're not a different species. Imagine, if you will, what it's like from the eyes of a child whose parent goes to prison. Now, very often, this is unexpected. And usually, without any explanation, they're left isolated, confused, frightened, invisible. And these children face overwhelming odds through the accident of having a parent who's gone to prison. Disenfranchised grief. So this is the grief that cannot be or is difficult to express publicly. It's a hidden, private grief. And this is extremely common with children who have a parent in prison. Not able to articulate what's gone on, if you imagine for a moment a child whose parent is killed in a road traffic accident, is taken away from them, and the response of everyone around them to show love and support for as long as possible. As a paradox then, imagine a child whose parent has gone to prison. And very often, the exact opposite is true. People want to move away from that child the stigma, the stereotyping, children and adults alike, communities. There are children in this community right now who are suffering as such. Imagine in your mind's eye a child walking to school on their first day, a pivotal moment in all our lives, but for this child, the father is in prison. This is exactly that image. This was taken many years ago by a mentor on the Invisible Walls Family Services. And she took this picture as the child was walking along because she was struck by the symbolism of it, the overwhelming odds this child faces. And I think as an image, it is quite a striking one. Through no fault of their own, the odds are against this child right from the start. Look at this. A landmark study found that 63% of prisoners' sons went on to offend themselves. That intergenerational transmission. But look at this. It's not all depressing. Creating and encouraging healthy family contact whilst in custody can reduce the likelihood of offending by up to six times. So despite all those overwhelming odds, we must be careful not to label children who have a parent in prison, because it doesn't have to be like that. They don't have to drift into following the same footsteps and all the rhetoric associated with that child's father's in prison and everything that goes with that. It doesn't have to be like that. And what we have seen over the years, time and time again, is children changing the direction. And the interesting element for me is that it's the connection with the family. 
Look at this. The Ministry of Justice, their own research, shows that for a prisoner who receives visits from a partner or family member, the odds of reoffending are 39% lower than for prisoners who'd received no such visits. 39% lower just by having visits and family contact. Now, I've worked in rehabilitation programs for more years than I care to mention, and I can't think of anything that could boast a statistic like that. Healthy family contact, it's like magic. Not only does it reduce the likelihood for the prisoner of reoffending, it also reduces the likelihood that their children are going to drift into those behaviours themselves. Just by maintaining that contact, that magical space within every prison, the visits hall, has that potential to create that. And this isn't new. It might seem like new research. It isn't. It's been knocking around for a long time. In fact, the power of visiting someone in prison is ancient and must never be underestimated. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. I'd like to talk for a moment about Lord Michael Farmer. He was commissioned by the Justice Secretary in 2017 to produce a review of this agenda, the impact on children and families and people in prison of that separation. And this has become known as the Farmer Review, a landmark study that has really changed the landscape for the prison and probation service in this country. Lord Michael Farmer, who in my opinion is the leading peer when it comes to prison reform, refers to family as the golden thread. The golden thread that runs through the criminal justice system. He also refers to it as the third leg of the stool. Education, employability, family, all these things combined, having somewhere to live. But prisons have an opportunity too here with this golden thread. And it varies, it must be said. If a prison can embrace this approach, if they can embrace the clear evidence base the family contact has, that positive impact, then that golden thread can become like steel. Prisons have that opportunity that visits hall, that magical space, amazing things can happen. And I'd like to give you an example of that that happened here in Park at our local prison. This is going back a few years now. There was a scouts club which still runs in the prison, quietly, invisibly, behind those walls, which was set up for children who don't have those opportunities in the community for one reason or another. But they were attending the prison to see their dad on a regular basis. And so opportunities are built around that routine. Now these children took it upon themselves to do a piece of awareness raising. Now at the time we were working in partnership with a charity in Uganda called Wells of Hope. Now Wells of Hope in Uganda, they find, identify, love, school, look after, house children who have been abandoned when a parent goes to prison, which unfortunately is quite common in Uganda, the culture being such, the shame being such that children will often find themselves abandoned when a parent goes to prison. And Wells of Hope scoop these children up and look after them and love them, school them, house them, and take them to visit their parents in prison. So we set up a partnership with Wells of Hope, kind of weirdly, Bridge End and Uganda, but it worked. And they came over here, the founder, and saw what we were doing, and, and I was fortunate enough to go over there and spend some time and see what they were doing there. So when we were working with the children on the scouts group, who were visiting the prison, visiting their dads, they wanted to raise awareness. So they took it upon themselves that they were going to stand up in their school assemblies, in front of the whole school, the teachers, all the other children, and they were going to say what it's like to be a child with a parent in prison. They weren't going to be ashamed. They weren't going to be invisible and hide away. 
They were going to talk about that. And they were going to change people's attitudes. And they did it. Imagine the courage that took for a child to do that. And then on the back of that, we had events running in the prison visits hall where money was raised and the prison match funded it and it got sent over to Uganda. And Wells of Hope, the children of prisoners in Wells of Hope also had a scouts group. But unlike our scouts group here, they couldn't afford the uniforms. And so they used that money to buy uniforms and you had this amazing, almost otherworldly experience of children of prisoners here in South Wales, helping children of prisoners in Uganda and communicating with them and sharing those experiences and supporting each other. And this is a picture of that that they sent over, proudly wearing their scouts' uniforms and holding up that sign to say thank you. And I'm pleased to say that that partnership still exists today. That was back in 2014. So as I get towards the close of this talk, I would like to reiterate again the power of family within this context, but also the opportunity that prisons have to create that magic. I want to leave you with one more example. And this is something that many prisons have started to do, not merely enough, in my opinion, but many have started through embracing the agenda, through embracing the recommendations of Lord Farmer and the clear evidence base, prisons have started to create opportunities such as the one I'm about to show you that happens again here locally in Bridge End. The opportunity for a young father to bath his newborn son. If that is not an example of magic, I don't know what is. Look at the expressions on both their faces. The power of that image is eternal. The resonance of it, you can feel. Such a simple thing to do, and yet so powerful. Hope, family, resilience. Thank you.